Of all the people you've advised over the last 10 years who followed your advice, what were the results? What percent got to their optimal blood sugar, blood pressure, and weight? What percent reversed major health issues? What percent didn't get the expected results? That's a big question. So let me to be as candid as I can be. Uh, everyone, if they maintain this diet, everyone, 100% unanimously, unless they had a kidney disorder, would get their blood pressure and blood sugar under control. That's easy. 97% uh, uh, of the people with cardiovascular disease, if they do the exercise, the attitudinal work that we need and clean up their diet, will eventually correct the causative reason for their heart attacks, strokes, et cetera. That's a given. Uh, diabetic type two conditions, 100% of them have the potential to completely recover from that so-called disease. It's really a lifestyle choice, not a disease. Now, cancers are a little bit more tricky. So we're not lucky like hospitals here uh, because we're not a hospital, we're an educational center. So when a person doesn't feel well, they go to the doctor, they go to the hospital and they're told, well, you have cancer. And then of course they have only three choices at that point. Well, now they added a fourth in, but it's really the same thing. They say, we're gonna cut you, we're gonna do surgery. We're gonna burn you either with radiation or chemotherapy, which is a big giant bomb. And now they've added a little excitement into it, immunotherapy. But by the way, in the United States, they force them to do chemo or radiation along with the immunotherapy. So it nullifies it, unlike in other countries where people are more important than profits. And so the reality is uh, when people come here, they usually have stage four cancer. We're lucky they have stage three. So they really have been sick for a very long time. They've been bombed by chemotherapy and radiation. And let me put it in perspective. People with cancers that have zero success, long-term survival rates, we've had hundreds and thousands of those people bring about their own recovery. Not because it's magic here. This is hard work. It's like finding the socket with the real energy in it. And you plug into that, you have the potential to come back to life. Am I going to say that 100% of those people recover? No, I'm not going to say that because there's an emotional factor. How weak is the person? You know, are they going to go back and do this 100%? Are they going to alter their lifestyle in a significant way or not? These are all variables. Uh, but, you know, that's the honest answer, the fair answer. But I can tell you, this is a heck of a lot better than dying. During the 20 plus year period you spent looking at blood under the microscope, what clear conclusions can you make about the impact of food on our health? Well, this is really interesting because my wife, not me, but I was privy to this. I sat next to her and learned from her, uh, looked at bloods of thousands, tens of thousands of people for more than 20 years. And one thing that is really interesting is healthy blood, which is rare to find, very rare to find, are round cells moving symphonically. It's almost like a Mozart concerto in that rhythmic way, in a clockwise manner. It looks almost like butterflies or lightning uh, bugs at night and moving with that gentle music behind you. We would see that in about three to 7% of the people, depending upon their age, more 7% with their below 15, and more than 3%, you know, above 50. Uh, the rest of people had something that the French named called roulette, and that's where cells stuck together. Now, let me portray what's happening. Every cell has electrons in it. That's what actually allows it to move independently, have the energy field around it, the, you'd call it an aura, I guess, around it, and literally, makes that cell attractive to nutrients and to other cells. So those cells ultimately become your bones, become your liver, your kidney, your brain. Every organ system is what those cells become. But because there's not enough electromagnetic electron energy in every one of those cells because they're not that healthy, 10 or 20 or 30 or 50 or 100, depending on how sick you are, a thousand cells come together to just get that little bit of energy. And that coagulated cell reduces oxygen, reduces nutrient uptake, reduces the ability to metabolize correctly. So you can either lose a lot of weight or gain a lot of weight that way. And more important, your brain and your organ systems do not work at the, in the way and the, at the level that they should. 
So that we learned. And when we put people on this lifestyle and we have them exercise, because exercise is as important a component as the food on this one, in, in a three-week period, it was usually about 14, 13 to 14 days between the testing, we would see about half of those people come back to somewhat normality. So they may not completely healed. I would say that's 20% or now all flowing and the Mozart thing is happening uh, and the rest are at least moving and there's not lots of coagulated cells. It was one of the ways, of course, we can't call it diagnostic in the United States, we're such a free country. But uh, what I can say is that when they don't get to that, you can actually measure the severity of their disorder when those cells were really stuck together, because that shows a lack of oxygen. And it goes back to the research that was done more than 100 years ago, or about 100 years ago, where they actually showed a reduction of oxygen uh, impelled the growth of cancer cells in that one. And also more heart attacks, more diabetes, more strokes, you know, all of the implications that you'd see with low cell movement and oxygen. Is reversing early stage cancer with lifestyle easy or hard or impossible? What about late stage cancer and how do you do it? Well, it's easy as your mind wants it to be. I mean, I think if you ask me as a nutritional scientist, what the most important part of this, it's attitude. So I see people come in here, they have stage one, nothing, they're kabishing and the problem, and oh my God, I'm sick, and I'm yelling, 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 they're not going to make it. And I see other people come in here with stage nine cancers. They've been to the top institutes in the world and they've been told you're going to croak. And they say, no, I'm not. And they walk through fire and they heal themselves. So we now know through bodies of incredible science, how imperative it is to have an upbeat view of your future. And if not, let me tell you, it destroys the immune system quicker than a hamburger does. So that's number one. So everyone that comes onto this campus and joins our programs gets psychotherapy. The most important thing we do here. Now we also have an energy medicine department that is really uh, taking and wiring your brain in a totally different new way. Things like Nucom that put you into a deep state of relaxation that activate immune function you know, at an extraordinary level. So we're doing all of these things that we can to get that calm mind and active immunity happening. Now, with all of that said, um, a person's view of adopting another lifestyle is pretty important too. If somebody's saying, oh, I don't like the taste of this every time they eat it, uh, it's not gonna work as well as if a person says, maybe this doesn't taste like eclairs to me, but by the way, I know it's going to heal me. And that was a work that was done by uh, the oncologist, Dr. Carl Symington, and somewhat Dr. Bernie Siegel, who was at Yale at one point. And uh, in recent years, you know, Dr. Bruce Lipton and others. And when you look at the power of visualization and intent, uh, you do it and I do it every day in our life, but we don't acknowledge it. For instance, every once in a while, I look around the Hippocrates campus here, 60 acres, and I remember uh, looking at the building that we built, me visualizing that building 10 and 20 years before I had it built. And I said, you know, we talk about visualization like it's some abstract thing. You and I do it every day. You know, you, you visualize what you want to prepare for food. You visualize where you want to drive. But most of us somehow when we become wounded, we become ill, we become limps. And we just say, oh, we got to go to somebody else to heal me, you know, rather than say, hey, let me visualize my own healing and the intent and the power of doing that. And then you confirm it by feeding yourself these phytochemical rich foods and you don't give in to disease and you don't give in to death. That unbeatable combination always works. So when I've worked with those stage nine diseases, let me tell you, I've worked with lots and lots of these people, tens of thousands of people and I've seen them get well, they've committed themselves completely to themselves. Not to a program, but to themselves. And once you get to that point where you're gonna walk through fire and do whatever it takes to heal, you heal. What can we do to prevent against 
bone fractures. There was a study that came out recently saying vegans have more bone fractures. What did you think about this? Well, I think they had to be poor eating vegans because people like me would have less bone fractures. A, a mineral rich diet that's living food uh, would, would actually increase its ionic minerals. Uh, so whoever did that study was probably anti-vegan or went to Beyond Burger or Impossible Burger eating vegans or junk food vegans. You know, people on all junk food diets, including vegan junk food diets, are not eating healthy food. Let's start with that. Uh, on the contrary, food has very little to do with bone strength. It's weightlifting that does. Anyone that doesn't know that shouldn't be doing studies on diet and, and bones. Uh, weightlifting, 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 weightlifting. Now diet. <laughs> That's how it goes. So when I had worked with people who have had osteoporosis, osteopenia, or do have it, or have fractured, the way that we bring about recovery, yes, of course, we eat this clean, pristine, incredibly nutritious diet, but that's secondary. That's way down the list. It's weightlifting. And what's also interesting, when you fracture a bone, that part of the bone almost never fractures again. Because when you break a bone, it's sort of like ripping the muscle ripping the bone. And so it, the intensity, the cells come closer together and there's less opening between the cell. So the elasticity of the bone's not there to fracture easy. It gets really strong, almost cemented into place is why weightlifting is number one. Yeah, now what foods, by the way, have it? Arugula, as an example, has eight times more calcium than milk does. And milk is not a good source of calcium for human beings. Great source to get cancer, great source to get diabetes, great source to get heart attacks and strokes and impel everyone to have more multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's disease, the list goes on. But you're not going to get much calcium, if anything. Matter of fact, that level of calcium globulated at such a high level for an animal that weighs a thousand pounds cannot enter into the human cell in any significant way. So eat arugula. It's a weed. By, it's free, by the way. If you live in a warm enough climate, free year round. Uh, spinach has three times more. And so when Popeye was eating spinach and saying it's strong, yeah, it builds muscle because there's a lot of protein too. And in fact, spinach has about 17% protein in it. And the reality is, but it also has major amount of calcium in it. But it's not calcium that people lack. Uh, I've uh, been now for since the 1990s, uh, looking at a very, very sophisticated nutritional profile on people. And in that profile, we find out that it's only one out of 125 women truly lack calcium. But what they do lack is biosil, which is silica, and biotin, which is an amino acid and protein, and weightlifting, 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 weightlifting.